to start the process of thinking about clinical trials. Let me go back and think about ABC Squared 15 years ago when we were formed. There were almost no drugs in the pipeline for brain cancer. When Dan Case, one of our founders, was diagnosed, I think the whole family was shocked at how bleak the landscape was, that there weren't things in the pipeline. The disease was so difficult. The location of the disease was so difficult. The market was so small. The life expectancy was so short that no rational pharmaceutical company wanted to begin work on trying to develop a therapeutic for brain cancer. That's changed, and thank goodness that's changed, and we're going to talk some about the reasons it has. Um, but first, I'd like to set the stage on clinical trials in general. They're part of the research process. You have a discovery phase where people working in the labs find a compound or a treatment that they think will be effective. They hone that using assays, other things, to then move into preclinical testing where they take those treatments into the best possible animal models to see if they'll work in a living organism. And if they get enough good results, they begin to move into clinical trials. And the norm has been a phase one clinical trial, relatively small number of patients, 20 patients to 80 patients maybe, looking to see if the compound or treatment they're bringing forward is safe. At the end of that period, they'll look for a determination of safety. If it is, they'll work with the FDA to move to phase two clinical trials, where they'll try several doses of that compound and look to see if not only if it's safe in that expanded trial, but does it have an effect? Is it effective? Are there preliminary indications of effectiveness? And if so, then they'll settle on one or two doses, move to the third phase of clinical trials, much larger patient populations, and really begin to assess whether this drug is sufficiently robust in its action to bring forward for patients. At the conclusion of that process, then, they will work with the FDA, and if it has been successful, they'll get a license to bring that forward and make it available to patients on a regular basis for particular applications. So that's the process we're going to discuss, is this phase one to phase three clinical trial, recognizing that there's a research underpinning beneath. So looking back 15 years, we saw a few compounds being brought forward for clinical trials. They'd been discovered happenstantially. They seemed to be logical, but nobody really knew. But then some things have happened. First, the Human Genome Project came forward, and for the cost of approximately $2.75 billion, we sacrificed, or sacrificed, <laughs> sequenced the first human genome. Boy, was that a Freudian slip. Um, but we're now at a point where you could do a whole human genome for approximately $1,000 in a research context. It shows how much has changed in that 15 years. The second thing that happened was we deployed that genomic sequencing capability <coughs> against a series of different types of tumors in what are called the Cancer Genome Atlas projects. And the first one of these ever done was against glioblastoma multiforme. And we were fortunate to have a hand in helping drive that decision toward that particular tumor type. And what it did was give us a much deeper look at the molecular character of GBM, gave us a better understanding, and let us begin to get a real grip on the biology of this type of tumor. That work is still ongoing, but it forms a foundation for this. Uh, the combination of the Human Genome Project and the Cancer Genome Atlas Project caused a major shift in thinking about cancer diagnosis and treatment. We used to think that cancer was a cancer of a particular organ. It's brain cancer, it's liver cancer, it's pancreatic cancer, and we treated it as such. Once we began to understand the genomics, we began to realize that this is a tumor of a particular molecular subtype, that there are drivers that are unique to that tumor, perhaps, but also may hold things in common with tumors you see in other organs. And this was a major phase shift in how we began to think about diagnosing and treating cancer. This also allowed us to look at other cancers, for example, breast, lung, melanoma, 
and say, gosh, if there are treatments for those larger market cancers that pharmaceutical companies are working on, that researchers are working on, perhaps we can slide those over and use them against brain tumors that have similar molecular pathways that we would like to target. So the age of genomically targeted therapy is fully in play now. <coughs> Part of the understanding that has also gone on is an understanding of how our bodies react to tumors and to treatments. It's given us a much better knowledge of how the immune system works, how it focuses on tumors, how it reacts to tumors, and that's going to lead us over time to an ability to begin to combine targeted therapies, immune therapies. It's actually a very exciting time for looking at how you think about attacking tumors in general. That's a big task. Thinking about the amount of information that you generate is just daunting. When the Human Genome Project came forward with its first sequence of a human genome, basically what we were delivered was a numeric parts list for a Boeing 747. Here it is, millions of different lines. You have to figure out what it is. We spent the time since then beginning to say, you know, that looks like a landing gear and that looks like an aileron, and that looks like it might belong in the cockpit. And we're gradually assembling a vision of how the genomic structure maps onto the actual biology of what's going on. Well, to do that, we've needed better tools. And if anybody knows about Moore's Law, the idea of increasing computing capacity and driving down cost, we've been the real beneficiary of Moore's Law. There are much more powerful um, computer systems that allow you to do levels of analysis we never thought possible. We hear about the fact that our cell phones hold much more computing capacity than the first moonshots. The same phenomenon is at work here. <coughs> but also, we're gaining access to huge amounts of storage. We can find data, generate data, analyze data, and put it in a place where we can go back at it and derive conclusions in an ongoing basis. The era of big data is upon us. And we all see the commercials with Watson on TV. Watson may or may not be the cure for everything, but it's an interesting illustration of how big data could be deployed to really help science in this space. So between a greater knowledge of genomics a greater knowledge of biology of patients and tumors, an analytical framework to go forward, that's propelled the system forward in a much more powerful way than we had available back at our beginning in 2002. What's also begun to happen is that we're hitting a regulatory framework where they're looking at this and saying that we as regulators in this space can be knowledgeable and helpful partners in the process. And one of the things that Brian and Dave are going to talk about is how this new type of clinical trial environment is making possible things we were never able to do before. And if I can provoke Brian well enough, we can even talk about what he maybe sees over the horizon. So it's not just what we're going to talk about now in terms of the insight trial, but where he can see things going forward in the future. So I think it's a very exciting time to talk about new trials and how they can help patients. I think it's also important as we talk about this to realize that very few people take advantage of the clinical trial infrastructure that's out there. You read numbers that 3% of newly diagnosed brain cancer patients wind up looking at clinical trials and participating. Brian's going to describe a system with 10 different centers that have gathered together to do this. And while that improves the scientific knowledge, what it also does is provide sufficient numbers of patients to actually power that trial to have an effect. We have to do a better job of making patients aware that there are clinical trial options out there. And the tools we have, for example, on our website, a section called Guidance. So if you look up www.abc2.org, we can give you a start on guidance of how to think about this, how to get to clinicaltrials.gov website. We have some people in the audience that are forming a new foundation that is designed to help match people with trials. We see a lot of new things starting that are designed to really let us 
more effectively test new trials, but also to let people move into a system where they can find trials and experimental therapies that may be right for them going forward. Uh, we look at clinical trial design as kind of a moving system. Um, it used to be that you had to wait to do clinical trials until phase two, or until um, a recurrence where you had failed on a clinical trial and then we could experiment on you. And that's because there was a standard of care in GBM, for example, where you had diagnosis, surgery, radiation, you would generally take Temodar, which became the standard of care. And then when that no longer seemed to be working, you would move to a phase, to a, um, a new clinical trial that could try a new experiment, experimental medicine. I'm getting ahead of myself mentally here. But this type of work is running hand in hand with a lot of the biological discovery. And we're seeing, for example, that Temodar is generally thought to work most effectively if you have a particular type of MGMT promoter structure and that it's not supposed to work as well if you don't. So you can find MGMT negative patients and enroll them in an early stage clinical trial where you don't have to wait as long. And we're beginning to see these biomarkers kick in to inform people making judgments about when a clinical trial might make sense. We can get into more detail on this as we go into the second phase of this discussion because Brian will talk about it in the architecture of the INSIGHT trial. But it's if you're here because you've been impacted by brain cancer, um, I think you'll find it very exciting to know that so many changes are taking place so rapidly in ways that are all designed to lead to more effective therapies for patients. I thought I should ask as we go forward, just so you get to know each other, how many people here, raise your hand, have been impacted by a brain tumor in their family, friends? I thought it would be pretty close to 100%. Uh, we're here because we care about this. You wouldn't come to downtown Washington, D.C. on a work day if this wasn't something important to you. So before we move to the new phase, let me see, we've got 10 minutes. I figure you come with some questions in mind, and if they're about the INSIGHT trial, I think we'll defer those. We'll have a setup where you can pass note cards forward, and we'll integrate the questions into the discussion. But right now, if you've got questions you'd like to ask, I'd be glad to take some. Pam Getz asked a nice question that you may or may not have heard, but she serves as a patient navigator for brain tumor treatment in a local hospital and helps the patients go through the process of dealing with standard of care, but then says when that process begins to be less effective, um, the patients have a hard time finding access to information, as does she, that helped them get to um, curated clinical trial information. And there is a clinicaltrials.gov website that lists every clinical trial that's out there. And you can find information on a clinical trial, but it makes no value judgments and doesn't suggest that you go in a particular direction. Um, we have some foundations that do this work. In our guidance section, we reference one that had been um, developed by the Sontag Foundation in Jacksonville, Florida, designed to help with this. Uh, but it's a it's a real conundrum. My colleague, partner David Sandak, is sitting here at the back table and he's going to speak with us. He quoted some numbers to me last night as we were talking about this that were just stunning about how few people take part in trials. So what David pointed out, and I'm doing this just so you can all hear, is that 85 percent of clinical trials fail in accruing enough patients to be effective as clinical trials. We also run into challenges that many of the treating physicians don't know about the clinical trials that are out there. You can ask your doctor, and you'd expect your doctor to be able to say, well, given what we know about your condition, you should think about this, this, and this. And my sense is so many of the treating physicians are busy dealing with treating patients that they're not up on what is available and what might be effective out there. It's a very difficult space. And not everybody develops enough information to even help make judgments. 
we've been involved in developing a genomic profiling system for tumors where we profile both tumor and normal to get kind of a profile of what a patient's genomic condition is. And we're shocked at how few people actually do this. They don't get foundation medicine testing at a beginning or anything, and there are no bases for making judgments that this tumor looks like this, therefore you should go in this direction. It's a complex continuum. You can do more genetic testing. You can do more other things. But far and away, the vast number of patients are treated in community hospitals. You know, they have a seizure driving their car, wind up on somebody's front porch or carried by ambulance, diagnosed while they're unconscious with having a brain tumor, wake up with a neurosurgeon saying, you have a brain tumor and we need to take that out right now. And all of a sudden you're in this process of uh, being operated on and cared for by a team where you've had no time to really select where you want to go or what your further options are. And I think sometimes there are emergent cases like that, but often you do have time to think and look. And even if there is swelling and other things that cause the um, seizure, you can get that under control while you make intelligent decisions. But my belief is you need to begin thinking about your clinical trial path from the very beginning and asking good questions of doctors and getting to good centers that are clinical trial relevant. One of the things I would like to see in these clinical trial centers is more humility. You know, so many of them say, well, we're doing one or two clinical trials and we'll offer those to you. And it's almost regardless of whether those clinical trials are well suited to the patient. Some of the centers we deal with actually say, our trials aren't the right ones for you and you should think about going here, here, and here. And that's just, to me, a question of having a humble, informed, smart doctor. Using humble in the context of a neurosurgeon probably is not the right combination of adjectives uh, because they're pretty sure often they know everything that's going on. So it really falls to you to say, I'm going to poke and prod. It's my health care. I'm thinking about this. I'm going to find my way to people. I'm going to find my way to resources. I agree that there aren't a lot of ready-to-go resources that help you do it. Some of the reason is that each patient is uniquely different, that you can't just say, this trial is this. Thankfully, there are a lot of brain tumor trials out there now and more coming, but making the choice um, is a difficult one. If you get into this and you need help, you can give us a call. We're not doctors. You know, we, I kid that we're like Tom Hagen and the Godfather. We're the consigliere. You know, we'll be your friend and talk to you and get you to the right people. Um, we have yet to put a horse's head in anybody's bed, but I think we would if it would help. Um, but use the resources you have available and find your way to that. And it's it's interesting to see the new groups like Sontag or like your Fast Trek group coming forward to do this. With regard to non-medical uh, approaches, nutrition, etc. And there are actually clinical trials going on in a lot of those spaces because they needed to do those in structured and thoughtful ways to begin to gather enough information to determine if different approaches are efficacious. A lot of that work has been in ketogenic diets, for example, of depriving a tumor of sugar, driven by early research that looked at brain seizures, as an example. Um, Cannabis attracts a lot of attention on this, although in some of the current political environments we operate in, it's difficult to get access to cannabis to actually do that level of experimentation. But those are indicative of the type of things where clinical trials are coming not just for pharmaceutical compounds or immunologic therapies. And if they've actually moved it into a formal clinical trial process, it would be listed in things like clinicaltrials.gov. I'm afraid that you kind of have to become your own self-interested scientific expert to do a lot of digging.